Hi everyone, welcome to all the builders and learners and thank you for joining us today. I'm Samir Chaudhary and I'm the Global Head of Workplace for HR and HR Solutions at Facebook. Today I'm joined by the extraordinary diversity strategist, podcaster, radio host, author and consultant, Torin Ellis. Welcome Torin. Torin is a trusted voice on... Great to have you here. Taran is a trusted voice on issues like diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging that are most definitely front of mind for leaders of organizations ever. Today, we'll be looking at key questions surrounding diversity and the power of inclusive workplaces, including how organizational leaders can move the needle and make real change. We will have some time to answer your questions, so, so please go ahead them as they occur to, throughout the conversations. So I would encourage all of you who are listening in today, first of all, thank you for joining us, but please go ahead and engage with us through this conversation so we can have the dialogue and also go ahead and answer your questions. So we will try to get to as many as we can later on in the conversation. So let us get started. Torin, it's been a challenging few months and weeks, you know, when it comes to racial equality. What advice would you share with leaders on how they approach this conversation in their organizations in order to build a more equitable, representative, diverse, and inclusive culture? Yeah, so the first thing, Samir, I want to just say thank you for allowing my voice to be trusted by the Facebook and the workplace team. I absolutely appreciate being here. Thank all of the people that are viewing with us going on this vocal journey that we are about to experience over the next 30 or 40 minutes. And my response to you is very, very simple. For leaders, all of them need to be transparent, truthful in this moment. I think when we think about bringing your whole self to work, we think about emotional intelligence. We think about situational awareness. And when you say you want people to bring their whole self to work, it requires you as a leader to be truthful and transparent. So that's the very first thing that I encourage for any and every leader no matter what industry, no matter what geography, no matter what they are grappling with inside of their organization, they have to be truthful and transparent. I really like that. I think it's so critical. I think you hit upon like truthful and transparency. Well, I think you hit upon a very important one that I would like to ask you a little bit more about. You know, an important aspect of that truthful and transparency is really creating the sense of belonging is psychological safety. You know, how can leaders and organizations, you know, build that into their culture? And what does a diverse and inclusive workplace look like? Yeah, I think oftentimes when we say psychological safety, what we are missing in that equation or in that statement is relationship. Samir and Torin have to have some degree of relationship in order for either of them to feel psychologically safe, to feel like that workplace really will accept whatever it is that they are experiencing or sharing are chasing after. And so we have to be able to create relationship inside of our workplace, inside of our business unit, department, and our teams. Required, vital, vital, vital. When we think about diversity, I think, you know, so many of us get, uh, we kind of get caught up in a myopic description of what diversity is. We tend to think about it being gender or race related, but we don't think about it from the standpoint enough of community, of geography, of creative innovation. We don't think about it enough from a standpoint of headcount management and all of the rest of the various aspects that go in to the definition of diversity. So when I get into these conversations, conversations that tend to, to take it down one particular lane or one singular journey, I try to stop whoever it is that I'm conversing with to keep them to remember or to remind them to remember that the definition of diversity and inclusion of equity and belonging is more expanded than they may be seeing. And that in fact, if you are chasing uh, some degree of result, there is no finish line as it relates to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. So tell us a little bit more. So you touched upon building a community. You know, you mentioned about building relationships. Uh, could you expand a little more and tell us, you know, as most of us are really connecting, you know, with each other remotely today, especially now that we're not there in person and like we're all joining, you know, as we are talking today, how can online communities kind of help foster that culture or how are the other ways that people can come together to be able to kind of build those relationships? You know, for me, Samir, I try to make sure that 
the advice, the counsel that I provide is sage, no matter whether we are virtual or in person. So my response to you is first and foremost, to never forget that people wake up in their circumstance and their condition. And that's what they bring to your workplace. If in fact you all are back in the building, they wake up in their circumstance and their condition. That's what they bring to the Zoom call. So we cannot ignore the fact that people are going through a variety of different scenarios at this point. Some are dealing with healthcare issues. Some are dealing with childcare issues. Some are dealing with a spouse that may have lost their employment. Some are dealing with uh, aging parents. Some are dealing with uh, aggression in a, a store place and they just hopped on a Zoom meeting and they're bringing all of that tension to the call. Circumstance and condition cannot be minimized in terms of consideration. So how do we do that better? We do that by being more present, by having that relationship that I mentioned a moment ago. Samir, you kind of look off today. It doesn't appear like you have the same level of energy that I'm accustomed to. I might hit you in chat and say, you know what, can we talk after this particular Zoom meeting or can you and I get on a call before the weekends? I just simply want to make sure that everything is okay with you. We can check in on our people. We can do Zoom meetings that are specific. You know what, instead of a business Zoom meeting, let's set up a Zoom meeting for first time parents. Let's just do a happy hour for first time parents. Only them on the happy hour. Let them build community and relationship and gain support from one another. We have a variety of ways to build high impact teams, which go far beyond just simply looking at a resume, offering or an extending an offering letter, and then saying, here's your desk and your computer. There is so much more that we can do if we are going to chase a substantive approach towards diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and building high-performing teams. That is so powerful. That is so powerful. I think the five fact that you just mentioned about the, you know, the flexibility that you need to have, but also just the thoughtfulness. I like the way you said, you know, your energy is off. So let me just go and hit you in a chat conversation and at least try to get to know you better to find out what's going on right now. You know, one of the things that often comes to mind in my conversations is, you know, when new people, new, whether it's new leaders who are coming into the organizations or new managers who are coming into the organizations and they first come out and, you know, they would reach out and say, you know, how, what are the things that I want to play a part and how do I contribute? How do I know that I'm actually doing a good job towards creating a more diverse, inclusive, equitable culture that creates that sense of belonging? So what would you say to them? Like, how should they think about this and how do they know where they currently stand and what, where the journey starts? ask you know i mean i think we want a particular type of answer we want a bit of fairy dust to be sprinkled on the solution we want some magical formula to be placed around the solution we think that we can go out and buy a piece of technology and it's going to fix all of our it's going to magically give us the response that we're looking for no just ask if you are a leader and you absolutely care about your organization you care about your people, ask. I'm not an incredible software developer, so I'm going to ask a software developer, how do I start, or how do I do this better, or how do I evaluate this on a resume, or how do I give this consideration just before I deliver that offer letter? I gotta ask. It's akin to our being in leadership, picking up the phone and dialing 911, and then sitting there and waiting for the 911 operator to be able to know what it is that we are experiencing. You have to ask. Second thing that you have to do, Samir, is you have to study. In the good book, it says, study to show thyself approved. So study, submit yourself to TED Talks, to YouTube videos, to books, to audio, to podcasts, to my radio show on Sirius XM. You have to submit yourself to some degree of study. I often say, that creativity or curiosity, curiosity is an important ingredient in DNI. You have to be curious. And then last but not least, you have to be accountable. You see, it's no longer acceptable for leaders, for individuals and others to sit by in silence as we watch the many injustices happen in our world. We can no longer be silent we have to individually say i'm accountable there is something that i can do to be a better human let me figure out exactly what that is and i'm going to 
go about the business of doing it. That is so powerful. I think the part that you just, just ask, I mean, starting very, very simple is to just ask the question and ask for help and I reach out. And I really like the way when you talked about literature, like just learning, you know, being curious and wanting to learn and having that empathy and just opening yourself up. I think one of the key things that I talk about when I, when you mentioned this, it also reminded me of the fact about unlearning. You know, sometimes we are kind of wired up as we grow up and we've kind of had our own experiences. In an organizational environment, you know, we bring people coming together from different environments, different cultures, backgrounds, experiences. And how can, you know, when we talk about the same kind of you know, extent, when you think about the leaders as well as, um, you know, people in whether they're managing people in a manager role, but even individuals across the organization, extending to your point about, you know, creating that curiosity is around how do they actually go down that path about that learning journey to know like, okay, now I think I'm getting educated. I think I'm learning more. And how do they now then transition towards link towards what, how they should show up in those conversations? I would love to know from you, where have you seen this go really well? Like examples of where, you know, when people can see they say, oh, this is how I'm actually now showing up. This is how I'm, you know, this is how I'm actually learning. And this is what my learning path would look like. If you could share some thoughts around that learning path and that learning journey. Yeah, I'll hit it from 30,000 square feet. What I say is that we have to be unafraid to bring the unusual, the unsuspecting, and the unfamiliar together. Knowing that when we bring them together, we can educate and direct and inspire them to go after a shared objective or mission. We can do that. And so what I would use as an example is, Samir, you and I are both in the talent acquisition ecosystem. And if you and I are having a conversation as we are today around whatever it is, it doesn't matter, whatever you and I are talking about, the moment I insert a person who might be blind, it changes the context, the layer, and the direction of that conversation. If I insert someone into the conversation that may have a hearing disability, it changes the, the layer, the context of that uh, entire conversation. And so what we thought might be a solution might have to be edited a bit because we've added a different dimension. So we have to be willing to bring the unfamiliar, the unusual, and the unsuspecting together, knowing that bringing them together, we will hit the mission and the objective that we have. Suji Jang talks about this extensively in her report, Cultural Brokerage and Creative Performance. Suji does a beautiful job of allowing us to understand you can mix together in a heterogeneous environment, you can add layers, dimensions, you can add different academic footprints, zip codes, uh, economic backgrounds, you can add different all throughout of that equation and you will still arrive at probably a better, maybe even more superior decision than you would have if we were just homogenous. So that's my uh, uh, suggestion to each and every person that's watching the broadcast this afternoon. That's wonderful. That is so powerful. There's so much in there. There's so much richness in that. I think it's so important for us to kind of gather through those conversations. So once again, a quick reminder for everyone who's engaging with us today, please go ahead and submit your questions. We are here to go ahead and we'll take them on as we continue the conversations. So Jordan, I'm curious to ask you one thing around, you know, I, I often get this question asked saying, and, uh, you know, since we have a lot of HR leaders as well as, you know, um, talent acquisition and people leaders who are leading and, you know, who are leading a lot of these initiatives in their organizations and are often asked this question is in, in terms of how do I show progress? What are the things that we should be looking at measuring to, so, to know that we are on our journey of learning? We are on a journey of progress. We know that this is the way we can show that we are making progress on diversity, inclusion, equity and belonging. I know that yeah, we made the subject for you, sir. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't mean to cut you off, Samir. Latency in technology. We measure exactly the same thing that we would measure under normal circumstances. Under normal circumstances, you measure your pipeline. You measure, you know, the mm -hmm. the amount of time a requisition might have been open, which I don't necessarily agree with. You measure whether or not a person went through unconscious bias training. Something else I don't necessarily agree with. But we have all of these different measurements. Why should it be different? Because we are focused on black and brown people, people that are LGBTQ, people that are differently able and have some physical impairment. Why should we be measuring it any different? We should be measuring them the same way that we measure white men and white women, the same exact way. So how many people are coming under consideration? 
Where are they dropping off in the interviewing process? How are they being educated, learning and development in the organization? What type of promotion, mentorship, support are they receiving? The same exact measurement. Diversity and inclusion doesn't mean that we have to do something different. And that's the problem with so many of the conversations that are out there. We think that it has to be incredibly different in order to do it. No, it doesn't have to be different. You just need to do it. Just simply do it. You do it the same way that you built teams in the past. But in the past, what you did was you were unintentional. You were less than genuine. You put forth less effort to go after different audiences, new communities, new collaboration uh, partners. You didn't add black and brown vendors to your supplier diversity list. Now, all of a sudden, we want to put money in black banks. I appreciate that, but we should have been doing that all along. And so now my hope is that you continue to do that. So we measure, Samir, the same things that we've been measuring. And in every organization, we look at what we're measuring and we say, you know what? It doesn't make sense for us to look at that anymore. Cool. Take it out. Put something else in. It's not a different formula. It's about being consistent in our work. That is so powerful. Thank you so much for that, Torin. I think just a quick reminder I, I would say is that when you just said this, which completely struck me, I think, at a personal level, when you said, there's nothing different that you need to measure. It's something, the fact that we hadn't, you know, we have to be intentional, we have to be consistent, and we have to follow through the process that we've always done and not really try to make this as something that is different. And then I could not agree with you more as a practitioner with all humility. I say this, that I think it's a great reminder for everyone who's listening in today is to remember this. So we have some questions coming in uh, from our live audiences. So we'll go to those questions and uh, we will continue the conversation. So the question Torin here is how can we engender our colleagues and staff to really safe, to feel safe enough to express their vulnerability? So we all are more connected and ultimately a stronger team. And thank you for that question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for it. I think, again, it just goes back to relationship. I don't know whether or not you can actually engender, whether or not you can actually empower someone. But what you can do is you can make yourself available to them. You can be like myself and say, you know what? I've apologized twice in the last year as it relates to this work. Once in Detroit, Michigan, when I told someone that they weren't black, that was considered under the uh, umbrella of colorism. So I had to apologize. I meant it in a fun spirited way. It didn't matter. It was my impact on that individual. It offended him. I apologized, made a donation, kept it moving. A couple of weeks ago, I apologized for a post that I put up around the administration's position around diversity and inclusion and critical race theory. I apologize. You won't find another person in the country more committed to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging than I am. Not one. You won't find another person, but I still apologize. So I show my vulnerability and people know that when Torrance shows up, it is out of love and process. So to the person asking the question, you just need to show up authentically, allow people in your workplace to know that's a person that really genuinely cares about me, the feelings of other, how I am progressing, how I am making along in this particular environment. Just show up authentically and the rest will work itself out. Again, just showing up with genuinity and expressing clearly in terms of the intent that you have and how you express yourself with that genuine curiosity. I think it's a great point. Uh, I will move to the next question. Um, we, what are some of the other ways that companies can be intentional? All right, so look, let's have a little bit of fun, Samir. <laughs> Number one, your CEO, your leadership needs to make a declarative statement around their position, the organization's position mm -hmm. on diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Your executive mm -hmm. leadership has to make a declarative statement. If your team and your leaders are not willing to make a statement, and it doesn't have to be public facing, it can be just for internal circulation. If they're unwilling to make a statement, you are employed by the wrong employer. The second thing that I'm going to look for is that you, uh, I'm sorry, that that leadership team reallocates resources inside of the organization. Mm -hmm. That means they will move headcount around and they will move dollars around to support that declarative statement. You hear what I said? Declarative statement, 
and move resources around. One way that I challenge every organization that I work with is to put money in a black bank. In 2000, we had 40 black banks in the US, 40. Today, we have 19. Those 19 black banks have less than $5 billion in assets total. So if you want me to really believe that as an organization, you care about diversity and inclusion, take a portion of the company's money and find a black bank and put it in that bank so that bank can start to invest in under-resourced and under-supported communities. Third thing that I want, make sure that leadership holds every single person accountable. I'm frustrated by hiring managers that are allowed to say that there's no talent in the pipeline, that chasing diversity and inclusion is a lowering of the bar, that is disingenuous, is disrespectful, and it is not something that I'm willing to sit by and listen to. And so you need to have leadership that is going to hold your leadership uh, 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 accountable. All of your hiring managers, all of your business unit leads, all of your department heads hold them accountable. If you do those three things, you will make a difference in your workplace. All right. Uh, that is extremely powerful. And I thank you for sharing that. And I enjoyed that journey you took me on right now. Uh, the next question is, uh, what are your thoughts on advancing more diverse, you know, talent from a talent acquisition standpoint, when especially looking at when you're on the either in the hiring journey, and I know you have some you know, strong points of view in this. This is coming in from a question uh, on industries like cybersecurity. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't really understand the question. I think that you know, uh, underrepresented talent should be advanced like every other talent. Like, I think that when we get inside of organizations, if you think back five, seven minutes ago, I said, look at the learning and development journey of all of your people. Certainly, your underrepresented individuals are they being mentored? Do they have a strategic mentor? And there's a difference. Do they have a sponsor? There's a difference. What is happening for all of the people in your workplace? Not just your white uh, uh, colleagues that have a relationship that you might go golfing with that may have come through another referral, but those individuals that are underrepresented in your organization, it may only be one person coming from an underrepresented population. There may be a new initiative of your organization. You see, diversity and inclusion isn't always negative. You may have already stepped out and said, you know what, we're gonna bring in an individual that's blind. Well, that's gonna require that we do something different in terms of development and support. We have to figure out exactly what that looks like. But certainly, trust me when I tell you, as long as that person is qualified, we are going to make every effort to advance him uh, or her in the organization. I'll give you one example. Every time I do a panel, no matter where I am in the world, my panel is always uh, uh, inclusive, diverse. It's always inclusive. I remember two years ago, I had Sam Sipa, who was on my panel. Sam is deaf. Now, normally, there's somebody on the stage doing sign language for the people in the audience that have a hearing impairment. No, I elevated Sam to the stage, to the stage. So he's speaking through sign language and we have a woman on the front row with a microphone sharing with everyone in the room what he's saying. Powerful. Because now I wanted everyone in that audience to see that this incredible individual who leads HR at his respective organization is deaf. He leads HR function and he's deaf. So we just need to figure out how to do something different, but we should never hold back on promotion and promotional opportunities for those that are underrepresented. Thank you for that. That was so powerful. And uh, I really like the example. It's, uh, I definitely have to go and watch that uh, talk. If it was uh, recorded, I would encourage all the audiences to do the same. It's, uh, these are some great, great insights. Uh, let's move to the next question. Can you talk more about unconscious bias training? One of our watchers wants to know about your thoughts as it's gaining traction across North America. Yeah, I don't like unconscious bias training. Now, I will tell you, I understand that everyone has biases. Everyone. But what I think unconscious bias training has done, it has allowed mediocre white men to hide behind a complacency or a curtain of complacency. Let me give you an example. If I'm walking down the street, 
I'm 235 pounds and you clutch your handbag and you move to the other side of the street, you consciously made the decision to move. If I'm walking through the lobby of a building and I can see you and you can see me and you're hitting the close button on the elevator because you don't want me to go on, you don't want me to wheel my wheelchair on, you are consciously closing the elevator door on me. If you look at my resume and my name is Samir Chowdhury and you discount me, you consciously made a decision because of my name, not my acumen, not my accomplishment, not my uh, contribution, not my tenure. You discounted me because my name was Samir. So I don't ever, ever encourage a client to, to go out and invest in unconscious bias training. I think it is absolutely a curtain of complacency and mediocrity, and it allows these individuals or these organizations to kind of placate. You know, let me just go do unconscious bias training. Let me spend a couple of dollars, a couple of hours. We'll make people feel good. We'll tantalize them just a tad bit. We'll make them feel like we're serious about doing something. No, you don't need to invest in that. I'm gonna tell you exactly what you need to invest in. That's my opinion around unconscious bias training. Well, Torin, you definitely have, I am tempted to ask you the next question, which is actually my question, which is when you said about unconscious bias training, and I think it's extremely powerful. Uh, I also, what is it that you would recommend? What are the things that you would want organizations and my, our viewers, everyone who's listening in right now to start focusing or repivoting their thinking in terms of as they approach plans as we get into 2021? Yeah, there's two things that are struggling or pulling at progress right now, probably more than two. But on one side, we have fragility. You have a whole lot of white folks that are running around afraid to have conversations around race and uh, around support that they have, have not provided. You have a whole lot of white folks running around that are a bit uh, hesitant to start conversation, to pursue initiatives and efforts. That's fragility. On the other side, we have fatigue. You have a whole lot of black and brown people people that have a, a, a different ability. You have a whole lot of people on the fatigue side that are like, look, we done seen this movie before. We done seen that press release before. We've heard you stand in uh, posture about how important this is and done nothing before. We just had a couple of weeks ago an executive for a major financial institution say they couldn't find black and brown talent. We just another, uh, last week had another executive say, we're gonna be an apolitical organization. And we're even offering severance packages for people who are not willing to uh, abide by the way that we are going to operate and monitor language in our company. Fragility and fatigue. So what I'm hoping is that people find some way to uh, rescind on their position. Don't be so entrenched in your softness, your emotion. Don't be so entrenched in your, I'm tired. We got a long fight. Yes, we've made progress, but we got to continue to move. We have so much work that needs to be done. And so I need white men and women in the conversation. I want them in the conversation. I need my black and brown brothers and sisters and those from the LGBTQ community and differently able. I need you in the conversation because I don't have what you have. I don't uh, operate or move through life the way that you do. So I need you in the conversation so that when we are building robust systems and when we are changing processes and when we are putting in uh, uh uh you know putting in play different opportunities and initiatives that we are considering the thoughts and the contribution of a variety of people i tell people all the time that diversity and inclusion is like this artwork behind me hundreds of different colors of paint layered on top of one another beautifully so I need less fragility, I need less fatigue, and I need more focus on how do we do the work that's required to move us forward. That is, on that note, I'm gonna go ahead and I know we are getting almost out of time. So I please thank you so much for all the questions that have come in and we'll try our best to get back to you as well. First of all, thank you so much, Jordan. Such a fantastic guest. I am so inspired 
and feel extremely honored. You've, you know, today, if you were all the others, like who are listening in today, if you were listening in, you would probably feel very similar to myself, which is I had, you helped me open up a new way of thinking and helped kind of give us some guidance around how we might want to approach such an important and critical topic around diversity, inclusion, equity, belonging. It's such an honor and thank you everyone for joining us live uh, for the first in our three part series on, on employee experience. Uh, uh, tune in next Thursday, uh, November 5th, uh, same time for our next live where workplace Abby Guthkills will be talking to Charlene Lee, who's a best selling author and speaker about how to create a culture of innovation. Once again, Torin, thank you so much and thank you to all the learners and builders who joined us today. On that note, I will see you soon. Thank you and have a wonderful rest of your day. Cheers.